Okay, good morning, it's Commissioner Ed Rothstein. We are in open session, July 15th. <clears throat> so good morning, Carroll County. Uh, we're gonna do a little, little bit different this morning just to get everybody uh, understanding. We're gonna open right now, do the Pledge of Allegiance. We will be going into close for pre-bid award contract negotiation, which should only take a few minutes uh, and we'll convene uh, behind us in the conference room. We'll come back in, resume open session, and we'll go from there. So with that said, let's all stand for Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, again, I apologize if uh, we feel like this is a little bit clunky, but it is the rules of the road. What I need now is a, a motion to go into close for pre-bid award contract negotiation. So moved. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Any conversation on that? All in favor? Aye. 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 Let's go into close. And so we'll back.
Okay, once again, it's the same, Commissioner Ed Rothstein, <laughs> and it still is July 15th. And we are now in open session. I'd like to start with Priority Carroll. We have a very, I believe, full agenda this morning. Um, and just a reminder, we will not be in open session next week on the 22nd. We will come back on the 29th of uh, July. But let's start with uh, Priority Carroll. Let's uh, go from my right, and that is Commissioner Frazier. Go for it. All right, thank you. This um, is my right hand. This past week we had a uh, Transit Advisory Council meeting. It was the first in-person meeting we've had since COVID started, which was great to have an in-person meeting. Um, ridership is slowly coming back on our buses. I think one of the big holdbacks on, on it coming quicker is the fact that on all public transportation you have to wear a mask and some people are resistant to wearing a mask. And you know, that, that's personal choice and all, but I think that's one of the big hold, holdbacks right there. But I can say something I've never said before since I've been a county commissioner. All the buses that we asked for from the state, we got. And we actually got them early. <clears throat> it's like, I, I, that's never happened. When I heard that, that them say that, I had to ask, what did you just say? Say it again. <laughs> it was <laughs> because of your leadership. It's, 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 never, really? it's never happened before, which is really, got that right. was amazing. <laughs> Very thankful for that. When we go down to Mako, I have to talk to the, to the, the uh, transit people from uh, Maryland and thank them for it because every time we go down there, ask them for the buses that we had them backlogged, and apparently we've got them all now. So that's that's tremendous. We had a MAKO legislation, a legislative uh, conference call. Commissioner Wentz and I were on that. Uh, just kind of bring this up today, what's going on with MAKO and how we're moving forward. It's kind of a, a, a kind of the middle of the season, I guess you'd call it, call. Um, it was, went very well. Um, I don't really want to say any highlights or anything about it, just that we're moving forward with, with MAKO and, and legislation and, and things of, of that sort. And I'll just let it go with that. Commissioner Wentz can expand on it if he wants to. I'm sure he's, I don't want to take all this thunder. You know? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Are you done? Yep. Okay. I think that was a segue to Commissioner Wentz. We'll find well, out. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> what are you going to ask for now? going to have to come up with something else to ask for with the with the MDOT. I but know, I don't know. Yeah, we'll have that, to that was my ask every time I went down to Ocean <laughs> City. Now I don't have to ask anymore. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Speaking of MAKO and Ocean City, we will be uh, at the MAKO conference in the, I think it's the 18th, 19th, and 20th of August. And, uh, you know, as a sign of things starting to get back to normal, uh, there are over 600 uh, registrants for that conference, which is a great sign and uh, a lot of vendors so with the exception of a few activities that are typically held it should be business as usual down there and um, it's always a great networking opportunity and i say that all the time uh, it's 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 really not vacation you're 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 in ocean city uh but actually when you go to ocean city battle in the traffic you're not on vacation anyway so <laughs> anyway uh it's it's, it's a lot, it's a ton of networking and some great valuable information will come out of that conference. So the Maryland Municipal League just had theirs two weeks ago mm -hmm. and uh, they, they, they pulled it off uh, without a hitch as well. So we're glad to see that. And uh, I want to give a shout out and congratulations to Prince George's County. They had the National Association of Counties Conference at the uh, National Harbor last week. And uh, it, it, it was also uh, incredibly well done and uh, NACO was supposed to be in Texas but they had it at uh, <coughs> Prince George's so wonderful <coughs> opportunity there and the networking was amazing there as well so congratulations to them um, and yeah we're in the middle of, of doing the initiatives for what we're going to focus on for that l a quaint little village of Annapolis beginning in January uh, there are 30 initiatives Mako's got it down to about 24, and we are going to try to get it down to four. But some great uh, ideas <coughs> on uh, changing the way in which things are done here. So more to come. I'm not going to give out anything because some of them are not obviously going to make the cut. Right. Uh, so we'll we'll, we'll it's get still there. Still very early to talk about what, what's happening there. Yep. So uh, so that's that. And I also uh, want to give a shout out. Uh, I was in. Uh, the Emergency Services Advisory Council meeting last evening, and then also stuck my head in the door of the Medical Advisory Board meeting. Uh, there's a ton going on, uh, 
not really behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, uh, as a result of us now having a, uh, an opening for a new director of fire and EMS. And the fire service is engaged like I've never seen them before in a lot of great conversation and thinking outside the box. And I'm looking forward uh, to when we can get the next director on board, which we hope will be by September-ish. Uh, somewhere around there. Uh, so uh, good good conversation there. Finally, my public safety message I always give. Uh, it's been raining a lot. So uh, the storms that came through here the other night created a lot of rivers. Just be very mindful uh, of, of, you, of the weather. Keep your eye on that. Everybody's got how many of these things attached to them. You can get a weather app instead of looking at Facebook. That, you know how I feel about Facebook. Had another uh, house on uh, Baltimore Street that unfortunately uh, tragically burned out. The good thing, uh, there were no injuries, uh, but the fire is being determined as being uh, started by smoking in bed. I, I don't know what to say. I, I mean, come on, people. <coughs> Uh, that that's just something that we thought we had a handle on so accidents can happen I, I agree but man you got to be aware of of safety uh, especially this this season so uh, those folks are being assisted by many organizations in Tawny Town uh, I think it put about 10 folks uh, out up there so uh, I applaud all the firefighters that, that uh, sacrifice their day to bring that under control uh, and um, I talked with the mayor of Tawny Town and uh, expressed, you know, if he needs anything, and he knows that, uh, that we would be there to help. So everybody did a great job up there, so thank you to everybody. So just be aware of your surroundings during the summertime. It's been a lot. There's an uptick in motorcycle accidents, too. Accidents, too. Uh, everywhere. Yeah. So you just watch out for them as well. Uh, I tell the story all the time. I had I almost hit one one day. You can lose a motorcycle in your A post on your windshield, mm -hmm. oh, just absolutely. like that, right, Ms. Windham? Yes, sir. <laughs> so, and Eric, yeah. you ride I, one I, as well. I sincerely appreciate you mentioning that because there's far more motorcycles on the road right now with the nice weather. So, be perceptive. Yeah. So, anyway, that's it. Yeah. So. Okay. Appreciate, Commissioner Weaver. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> last night uh, Board of Education meeting and uh, uh, <clears throat> Ed Singer did have a presentation uh, he gave there and I think he's going to be on a little bit so he can back me up a little bit here but uh, his news and updates here nearly all cases now uh, uh, hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19 in Maryland in the past month are unvaccinated people and it's the age is moving down the older group is vaccinated, so you're starting to see uh, a lot of the uh, variants uh, uh, coming through, and it's hitting also a lot of younger people. I think Ed mentioned uh, most of our hospitalizations are uh, school age kids now, so it's starting to uh, work its way down. The vaccines appear to be effective against uh, current variants uh, and extremely effective preventing severe illness and death from COVID-19. So. And I know the school system is working on uh, following the CDC, CDC school guidance uh, uh, issues uh, issued July 9th um, that, you know, what are they going to do here for young kids and not being vaccinated and, you know, multiple strategies are going to have to come together to stop the spread of these things. But uh, he did a great presentation to the board. They have a lot to think about and have to start looking uh, at a lot of their um, way they're going to handle things here in the fall as they open up uh, under normal circumstances. The other thing is we have a new judge in town. Well, tonight at 5 o'clock, I believe, uh, uh, Brian DiLeonardo, Le our uh, state's attorney, is now going to be a circuit court judge uh, appointed. And I think uh, he has to run for office here from the circuit court. Mm -hmm. But uh, that will be uh, a nice, uh, I think, addition to our court system uh, we do have uh, a, a good judi judicial yeah if I could say it judicial system here in Carroll County and Brian would be a, a good asset to that so uh, we wish him well okay Commissioner Boucher 
Thank you. And, and I'll reiterate, we have one of the best judicial systems in the state of Maryland, and we're very fortunate. Uh, I want to mention that uh, if you don't know or haven't read the headlines, that the overdose deaths for last year were up 30 percent. That's a total of 93,000 fatalities to overdose. So in the midst of this COVID epidemic, we've been hit very hard with the uh, addiction. So if you're out there and you have a loved one that suffers from addiction, please help them get to the resources and the therapy and counseling they need so we can try to get that number down. Uh, headlines, they also said that the carry out alcohol sales have been approved, but our liquor board will need to work out the administrative details. So anyone that's out there in that industry, please take the time to weigh in their concerns on that because it's important for our business development that they be involved in the regulations. And also, if Mr. Swam is out there, do you have the Ag Preservation Bus Tour info out there? We are going to have a Ag Preservation Bus Tour on October 16th. So anyone out there is uh, interested in what our Ag Preservation is about, this is going to be a prime opportunity to learn more about agricultural land preservation in Carroll County by visiting preserved farms in the Westminster area. The farm owners will share information about their farms and their programs. Participants must go online and register. This will be a free tour. It'll be two 46 passenger buses with air conditioning. It is a first come first serve basis. So if you're interested, please check in. There will be a waiting list because of course, occasionally some people for whatever reasons will have to cancel out. The buses will meet at the Farm Museum parking lot at the outer pavilions. It'll begin on October 16th at 10.15 a.m. meeting. The buses will leave at 10.30. They'll do the tour and come back to the Farm Museum for a commemorative celebration. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Weaver, are they coming to your property too? or uh, Not that I know of. All right, well, <laughs> this, this is a really tremendous opportunity for people. You know, sometimes ag preservation can be positive, it can be controversial. But this is a great chance for people to get there and, and get an education on what we're doing and how important it is. So thank you very much. They'll spend their entire time in District 1. That's right. <laughs> That's Coming from percent. District 3 up to District 1. Okay. No, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> no, thanks. And uh, thanks, Commissioner Boucher. That is, we are really excited um, to highlight where we've come from the initial goal. Uh, back in 1980 and uh, you know having the event coming this fall to highlight the 75,000 plus acres that we have preserved in Carroll County with the goal of 100,000 acres. A um, couple things I know uh, Mr. Singer is uh, scheduled to come in open admin to talk a little bit more about the COVID-19 that was brought up. Uh, I appreciate that um, just to uh, let the community know this is where we are because sometimes I feel that uh, we we look at it statewide, and we're not necking, you know, not bringing it down to the county. And when you look at nationwide, they say, "Oh, Texas is this, and this state is that," but they don't look at the specific counties. And um, I think it's important to uh, to bring Ed in and say, "What's going on here in Carroll County?" And that's that's who we serve. Um, so I appreciate his time. Um, I had a uh, Ag Board meeting on Tuesday night, <laughs> thanks, and uh, it was a few hour meeting. It was, it was very good. I'm so appreciative to uh, be a part of that uh, board. Uh, they're very enthusiastic. They have the 4-H uh, uh, fair coming up um, the end of July, uh, 31 July through 6 August. Um, so it's always a great event and looking forward to uh, participating in that. Um, and just again seeing what makes Carroll County so great um, and the work that they do. Um, the only other comment I just want to make relatively quickly is the newspaper is doing a good job in working hard to get the activities that we are saying are happening here in Carroll County, especially from our county government. However, sometimes they don't cover all of it and uh, it's a challenge. So if there's question, instead of, you know, slamming the, the reporters or somebody or the activities on social media, uh, and feel free to reach out to us and feel free to reach out to our, to our staff. Well, what did you mean by? And, and one of the uh, activities had to do with the um, relief funds, the $32 million, and how there's 
57 million dollars of projects and we have to figure out how to get to 32 how to you know figure out the projects and spending the 32 million dollars well on social media uh, I've seen anywhere from give it to the teachers give it back to the community have turf fields do a lot of other things and, and the fact is we are we, we have parameters around how to use this money uh, that wasn't highlighted specifically in the article and uh, sometimes also people just read the headlines so they're going to see the headline and not get in depth of the article and it's, that's just one example there's lots of examples uh, that we can talk about what I'm trying to say is as Commissioner Wentz says very often we are transparent we are receptive and open to the community reaching out to us to have those those conversations and uh, share with you these are the activities that are happening so don't just rely on one news source absolutely don't just rely on social media uh, you know and and you know get get to the horse uh, get 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 to the, uh, the 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 source of the information so um, okay let's get into Jack why don't you come on up and talk to us about the purchase of land Just think it's time to do this. I'm glad the land is there. I'm glad it gives us the opportunity to look at other ways to handle trash, not just burying trash, but other ways to handle it. Yep. We need the, the land to, to, to look at those ways, and we finally have the opportunity to do it. I think it's we should move ahead with it. I really do. Great. Yeah, and I was yep. thinking the, the same. Uh, I really appreciate the innovation and innovative thinking of how to deal with this. Um, increase in the life cycle we 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 recognize the problem you're coming up with solutions um and it is uh an economic development you know uh process how can we continue to uh develop appropriately um the property itself the question is um can it be used for other things once it's purchased by the county and how can it be used it's a good question by other things I believe the method, uh, the method and way that we're purchasing this property, um, ideally, it's in, and I'll say this for pretty much you know any pro you know, the initial use is for landfill operations. Um, but if you're talking different uses, is if we wanted to sit back and we have you know some part you know say 30 or 40 acres that could be used for solar, um, in order to bring in some revenue to the county or to reduce some of our electric rates. Um, we should we will have that flexibility to do that on land that may not be developed in the future um, but I just I caution that we need to get some studies done we will need to get studies done first of what is land that we could you know what purposes could we use par par parcels or portions of this land 
moving forward before we start looking at bringing in any other entities or any thoughts. I'm not sure the direction you're, you're thinking of, but I always want to be sure that, you know, we had, you know, Hepacre Firearm Facility mm -hmm. is a great facility. It's been a, a huge um, asset for this county, um, but that was placed on a uh, con uh, construction debris mm -hmm. uh, cell that was, you know, was designated for construction debris landfilling. Um, the choice was made to put the firearms facility there. Great facility, but now you know we lost part of that asset um, in order to handle some material that is doesn't biodegrade quick because it's usually concrete and in two by fours um, and shingles. But um, but it's you know we did lose a little bit of that facility, so we want to be sure that we're very smart about how we develop and what we think about future uses. I, okay, and I appreciate that, but I also caution you not to do something. I mean. <clears throat> uh, there's a, a term paralysis through analysis. In other words, if you over analyze something, you're never going to get to actually do something. And um, there's a lot of property up here that can be used. So looking at innovative ways to use it to bring in either revenue or quality of life for our community, I think is very important. Understood. And not just uh, there, there is another there is another piece. use too. Uh, uh -huh. We get calls all the time from farmers that are looking That's for right. farmlands to, uh, you know, to use and uh, no, we, Mr. Weaver and I, Commissioner Weaver, we've been talking about it. And there's a lot of good land that could be farmed on there, and uh, um, th there is income producing. I think long term for the farmers, and we can work with Commissioner yeah. Weaver on that. And you said, Commissioner Weaver, thank you for bringing it to us. Well, I tell you, this is a real team effort on this one. Um, I, I've got an education in the last three months on trash. These guys, so, You're but I might have been in the. the Negotiator, negotiator, but it was, this was really a team effort, yeah, you know, with everybody team. on this, yep. you know. But, you know, I, I just I think this is a great opportunity. And Commissioner Wentz, you were right. I mean, I've been here 20 years, and this always comes up, and we seem to take a pass on it. But this this is the opportunity right now. The the seller is motivated, and I think, um, you know, if I had a vote, I would say, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure you would. Uh, I concur with his vote. Uh, okay. Cliff? Uh, all right, can we help? So you know, we'll help be, you be, before we get into that, uh, and we are going to go, uh, since I've been off script from opening this morning, um, let's continue to stay off script a little bit. And if there's public comment on this before we move forward, okay. um, I would appreciate it. I know, Mr. Hayden, you're probably here for this. If you'd like to say a few words now instead of Typically, we do it at the very end, but that will probably be in about an hour and a half, and this will already have been completed. So, uh, if you'd like to say a few words now, you're, you're more than welcome. Okay, just uh, go up to the mic. Please uh, announce who you are, and uh, you've got a few minutes to tell us I what's appreciate on your mind. It. I appreciate it. So, by way of introduction, just so you know who I am, um, Jack Hayden. Um, I uh, lifelong resident of Carroll County, uh, property owner in Carroll County, both commercial and residential. Uh, operated um, several businesses in the county currently and in the past. Um, professionally, uh, I'm 40 some years now in the solid waste industry. So I do what you're talking about every day of my life. Um, I love it. And uh, I started in the residential business, picking up household. We still do that. Uh, pick up about 35,000 homes. Um, I'm currently operating a, a C and D recycling and transfer station. Um, I um, I have owned long haul tractor trailer companies that do the transfer that you're currently doing. Uh, I've been a partner in a landfill in Virginia, so. I know everything you're talking about. It's my life, and it's what I do, and I live here. Um, I'm very familiar with this project. I'm very familiar with the land. I'm familiar with the owners that own the land. Um, and um, I'm here as a resident. Uh, I'm here as a taxpayer. And I'm here to support uh, the, the, uh, the county residents. I'm here to support the county staff in their recommendation. And I'm here to support the commissioners in their decision that they have to make. Uh, the comments were very well 
right on target, all of you. Uh, this is an unbelievable opportunity for the county. The state of solid waste in Maryland and nationwide is getting in many cases very critical. It's very critical in Maryland right now. There is no more landfills. Every jurisdiction is running out of space. Every jurisdiction is running up against deadlines five, six, ten years from now. And in this industry, that's a short period of time because these things don't happen overnight. So, Steve, your comments were right on about the opportunity. And I was so thankful you guys are supporting this because these opportunities have come along very seldom for a perfect site. You have a perfect site to do all the things you're talking about. Uh, so um, I'm here to support it. Um, and um, I think you're doing the right thing. Uh, so okay, that's it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to know is, uh, Chris, and you have the controls, if we yes. have any callers that are specifically on the line to talk about this item, can you uh, I will find let out. me know? Caller number one, please identify yourself if you're wanting to make a public comment regarding this item. I'm not sure that anybody actually knows what number they are. You, you're speaking. Are you calling about okay. this specific? specific item? Yes, this is Jill Popowicz from Reese Road. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, we were actually all just informed of this purchase that's been in the, in, I guess, in the works for the last six months because of the newspaper article. So, you know, luckily we have that outlet to, you know, kind of learn about these things because nobody from our, our county government ever reached out about it to anybody to ask about. So um, we're going to be watching this very closely moving forward just to let you know. I'm sure we will have additional comments in the future as we can kind of learn more and see if anybody actually reaches out to us and talks about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris, is there anybody else on the line? There are nobody other callers at this moment. Okay, I appreciate it. Again, I apologize going a little bit out of order, but I felt that uh, it was pertinent to this discussion. Um, those that were available to uh, provide from public their opinions any other further discussion from us I'd just like to make a yeah. comment it's very important to do what Jeff was saying earlier to do a survey of the site mm -hmm. to find out what area would be useful for land for landfilling and what areas not that way we won't get our in our own way down the road because you know you don't want to put this cell over here or this place over here might be useful for landfilling this place might not because of the t t topography or whatever's around there so we could put other things over here but this would we have to preserve so that's a very important step that I think we have to look at first before we do anything with with this property thank you yeah I'll tell you I just I dealt with this on Fort Mead with the cab landfills I yeah. mean and like Mr. Ian you said there's just no space you right. know um, so we have to be innovative on yep. how we're dealing with this any okay. other uh, comments discussion well, I'd just like to state that very seldom do people like to hear their politicians talking trash, but I think us talking trash today is a positive. <laughs> and I, I really like the fact that as you guys eventually move into the engineering design phase, that you're focusing on a good customer, citizen, user-friendly environment. And I think that's something that's been severely lacking. And I think all of us as commissioners have heard complaints about the flow and egress and ingress and all that. So ultimately, we're going to have a very, very user-friendly landfill system that's in tune with all the modern demands of the recycle and the compost and the construction material. I think this is going to be spot on. Yep. Uh, Mr. Thank Winch, you. you want to read this? No. <laughs> I'm, I, I just think, again, I, I said it. I, I don't want to be that set of commissioners that had the opportunity and didn't take it. I, right. I'm going to move that we approve the acquisition of the KMP Resource Recovery LLC land as presented. Second. And oh. this is known as a library and landfill. Oh. <laughs> you say he's full of trash? <laughs> so uh, I have a motion and I have a second uh, for the acquisition of the 326.7323 acres for purchase of $13,069,292. Any further discussion on that? No, sir. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 
Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you all very much. All thank you all very much. much. Thank you. And no problem. Now, now the, the work sons. really starts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Let's uh, let's move on. Uh, Ms. Eisenberg and Ms. Lane, hop on over. Hop in because of your ankle. Are you feeling okay? Yeah, fine. Okay. Much better, much better. Good morning. Good deal. Good morning. Good morning. Um, okay, we're going to talk about the 2020 planning annual report. Yes, yeah, so good morning, commissioners. I'm here with Mary Lane, our planning manager, and we are going to give you a presentation on the annual planning report. As it says, it's an annual report. We do this every calendar year to reflect planning and zoning commissions, not only in Carroll County, but also the municipalities as well for their planning and development activities over that calendar year. We have to do this under the annotated code. It's required by the land use article and we report this to the Maryland Department of Planning. So we're here today just to give you a briefing of what we presented and submitted to the Maryland Department of Planning um, as of July 1 of 2021. So with that, I'm gonna have Mary give you a presentation um, on this annual report, some of the highlights, and we did send this up to your office on Monday, the hard copy. So you should have had, um, you should have that in your inbox. Right, so Mary? Thank you. And I'll be walking you through page by page, but okay. in a, I'll do it quickly. Um, as Linda said, this is, we are here for informational purposes only. This isn't something that you have to approve. This is something that was certified by our planning commission and every year is sent to the state. Um, we are required specifically to include in the annual report changes to plans, plan amendments, subdivision site plans, any text amendments or map amendments, um, new roads, parks, schools, water and sewer amendments, and then really the entirety of the pipeline, preliminary plans, recorded lots, uh, building permits, use and occupancy certificates, development capacity analysis, which we refer to as our BLI, our building land inventory, and agri agricultural preservation over the past year. Just real quick, um, sure. it is certified by the planning commission, not approved by the planning commission. Correct, correct. that is what the state requires okay. of all the planning commissions. Who to submitted. certify, not approve. Yes, correct. got it, okay. So um, this report, as every year, includes information for the county and all eight municipalities. Um, the development information for the towns is submitted by the town staffs. We also have our own agencies contributing to this report. And you can see on the acknowledgements page in the beginning of the report, all the different staff and agencies that contribute to this report. Um, basically, based on the land use article, the purpose of this is development related activities are to be consistent with the local adopted plans and should implement the 12 planning visions. So uh, very quickly, the process, we begin in January, we work with other county agencies and our towns gathering the required information. Again, it's required by the state, it's not up to us what to include in the report, and it's all planning and development activities during the previous calendar year. Um, our report was completed and presented to the Municipal Planning Commissions during May and June. Um, our Planning Commission reviewed it on June 2nd and certified it on June 22nd. Um, we transmitted it to MDP on July 1st, and it's been posted on our website as our previous um, reports, if anybody wants to look at those reports and compare them to see what's happened over the years. And copies of the report have been sent to all the towns. So um, I, I will run through the report, but I'll do it quickly. Just on pages 2 through 11, there were several amendments regarding new plans and plan amendments. There were several amendments to the Carroll County Water and Sewer Plan that became effective in 2020 as part of the spring amendment cycle. These amendments pertain to the city of Tawnytown, the city of Westminster, the town of Mount Airy, and the Freedom Area. And that is, I believe, on pages two and three. The rest of those pages are maps that show you the water and sewer. Um, on pages 12 through 15, you can uh, see the site I plan. I apologize, Mary. The, sure. <clears throat> the updates that are provided on pages two and three, mm -hmm. um, the decisions on those updates, how were they presented? I mean, did it go through the planning commission or how, what, what's the process? 
So that's our water and sewer amendment process, uh -huh. so that we come to you um, with amendments either for our system or on behalf of the municipalities for their system. And that goes through a review process through the county as well as planning commission, and that is brought forward to the Board of County Commissioners in the form of a public hearing that you all hear to um, amend and adopt the updates to the water and sewer master plan. But as with all water and sewer plans, Maryland Department of the Environment has the final say. So once it is approved, it becomes effective. Right. By MD. I feel like I'm throwing these softballs up there so no. you can hit them out Thank of the you. park. Because <laughs> the key about this is to ensure <clears throat> that the community knows that these are not new decisions, that these are decisions that have been made and there's a process into getting to where we are today. Absolutely. So, okay. That is a very great point. Thank you. I appreciate that. You hear that, Commissioner Fraser? She said great. <laughs> okay, on pages 12 through 15, you can see the residential and commercial industrial site plans and subdivisions that have been approved. Um, within the county, there were 14 lots on 57 acres. Within the municipalities, which was Westminster and Tawnytown, this is regarding residential, 158 lots with 226 units for a total of countywide 172 new residential lots with on, I'm sorry, on 118 acres. Um, likewise, for commercial and industrial, this is done by acres and not lots. In the county, there was um, about 120 site plant, acres of site plan approved. And in the municipalities, there was 13.5 with, in the towns of Westminster, New Windsor, Mount Airy, and Hampstead for a total of 130. Acres. So again, I think as Mary stated before, a lot of this is the pipeline. So if you think about this, so just because we have a site plan or subdivision approved does not necessarily mean like the next day it's going to be developed. So as you see as we move through, use and occupancy permits, that's the final phase of development. So you have your subdivision, then your building permits pulled. Use and occupancy is when it's met all the code requirements and you could actually take over that facility and that's a completed construction project. And I think that's important to note because you may not see 172 units developed if you see 172 lots approved. That's not a one for one because they can stay in this stasis for, for years until someone decides they want to build or develop that site. So just because it's subdivided um, or site plans are approved does not necessarily mean development will happen eminently. So this is the map of the subdivisions and site plans approved last year. The yellow dots are residential, the um, purple are non-residential. I think the takeaway from this map is the development is clustered where it is intended to be often, which is in the growth areas and the towns. Um, regarding annexations, there were three annexations last year, two in Westminster and one in Hampstead, and again, those those go through the entire process that we talked about with um, public comment going through the commissioners and then being heard by the towns as well. And just to be clear, annexations are processed by an applicant, the property owner that wants to go into the municipality. Our role in it is making sure that we have agencies be able to comment on it and the only official action that's taken is if a zoning waiver is requested. This body has to grant the zoning waiver when the difference in zoning is 50%, let's say, more intense than mm -hmm. the actual current zoning, So, or else they cannot rezone for five years. So just so um, that's the action that's taken typically. And I think the other takeaway from this chart is the, the size of these annexations. You'll see in recent years that they're just not large properties. Right. Um, also in the report on pages 19 through 23, um, revisions to local ordinances, which means zoning and subdivision ordinances, you can see that in three of the towns they did have zoning text amendments. You as the county commissioners had no zoning text amendments last year. Um, again, you had one at the very end of um, 2019 that showed up in the 2019 annual report. Um, there were no changes to the PFA boundaries. There were no new schools or additions. You can see, I believe, um, the changes to the roadway network. <coughs> Sorry. Our, that's on pages 21 and 22. You can see that those are primarily system maintenance and local in nature. 
Um, Westminster did amend their master distribution chart and water and sewer allocation policy. There were no new county parks, but there was the development of Wakefield Valley Park in Westminster. <coughs> Um, next is building permits issued. That's on page 33, and this includes both residential and non-residential. And the way the state requests this is to look at it both inside and outside the PFA, as well as inside and outside of the MGAs and DGAs. So the total here is 537 building permits issued in 2020. Um, as you can see, again, as in prior years, most of them are inside the PFAs, roughly 70% inside the PFAs and inside the MGA, DGAs. How does that um, <clears throat> compare to earlier years? I know there wasn't much of a change from 2019, but I can't okay. answer, okay. like I didn't do a trend line on. Just curious, well not It's curious. very similar, I mean, year yeah. after year, because we have to meet those goals of trying to produce most of the development within mm -hmm. the priority funding area. We can send that up to our, sure. I think in prior years we have had to report like a five year trend, but we. And, and that's what I'm looking at is, are there trends analysis that we can use um, that can help prioritize our efforts? Mm -hmm. so. You know, absolutely, and, and again, the idea is we have these municipal growth areas and designated growth areas yeah. that are the county's mm -hmm. designations, um, and then working with the state for the last 25 years, we've had to uh, come up with priority funding areas, and that's where the infrastructure is and where the state helps to prioritize right. funding for development and supportive development. Okay. Again, on page 34, you can see the map of where building permits were issued. Um, this one doesn't look as clustered as when you looked at subdivisions and site plans um, because they are individual permits that were issued, but you can see certain patterns here within the growth areas, as you would expect. Um, and the, the next thing is use and occupancy certificates, and this really shows you what was going in on the ground in 2020, because this is the last step in the process. This is on page 36. Um, there was a total of 402 use and occupancy permits issued. Um, again, 61% inside the PFA um, and the DGA, MGA, roughly. So um, the trend is about the same as the not the trend, but it's about the same as the building permits. Um, and I do have a graph showing a six-year trend on the use and occupancy. Again, here's the map for that. That doesn't, doesn't really tell you a lot other than, again, clusters in the MGAs, DGAs, PFAs. Um, this is the 10-year trend on use and occupancy certificates countywide. As you can see, it's been relatively stable. Um, it's up, it ticked up a little in the last couple years. Um, this is just residential, that's why that's 367 and not 402, but um, this is what we've been reporting to you the last several years is a pretty steady um, level of growth. And um, this is commercial, again, steady over the last eight years. There were some outliers in those 2010, 2011 that actually explained those big numbers. But if you just want to look at the last eight years, that's a pretty steady that growth. Bridge? That one is not, no. Isn't it's actually it's UNOs, concerns. but some stream. Uh, there was a few clusters of things that happened that year, those two years. So um, the next thing that's required is looking at potential developable lots, which is our BLI. Um, this is on page 40. I tried to boil it down a little bit here. The existing dwelling units in the county at the end of 2020 were 65,253 with 24,692 potential lots. So total lots at build out is 89,945. And there are a lot of caveats to that number. There's a lot of um, uncertainties. It's not to be taken as a um, a really good solid number of how many units could be developed in the county, but it's the methodology that we use given what we know right now. Like for instance, we can't tell if a lot has perkability or things mm -hmm. like that involved in it. What we try to do for buildable land inventory is look at the property itself, um, look at the underlying zoning so we could figure out how many units per acre would be allowed 
on that particular property. Then we look at environmental features and we take out for those and we take out for other necessary items that would be required for building. What we don't account for are landlocked parcels. Um, what we don't account for is if the property can perk or not, um, or if even water can be found on that particular property that's out of the water and sewer area. So this is typically a high number. Um, in reality, a true yield would probably be much lower than that, but this is the high estimate. Thanks for clarifying that. And you have a breakdown of by designated growth area. This, because I mean, if you do the analysis, if you break down by designated growth area, then you look at, okay, where's the water allocation? I mean, just exactly what you said, mm -hmm. you'll refine that number to a much more um, realistic number than this. This seems extremely high, so. Um, again, the state requires this to be broken down by PFA and MGA DGA. So at build out, 51% of the lots would be inside the PFAs, 48, 49% would be outside the PFA. And at build out, 54% of lots would be inside the MGA DGA and 46 will be outside. And that is for residential only. Um, for commercial industrial, there are currently 5,009 acres of commercial industrial, potential acres of 3,404 for total acres at build out of 8,413. Um, and regarding the PFA and M MGA DGAs, 84% of the acres at build out will be inside, 16 will be outside, and 78% um, of the acres of build out will be inside the MGA DGA, 22% will be outside the MGA DGA. And again, we, we produce this <coughs> because the state requires us, they, they would like to see this, this is why we do it in this way. And for industrial acreage, just to note that when priority funding areas were first established in the late 90s, priority funding areas, whether they were on infrastructure or not, were automatically considered a priority funding area. So all industrial zone land prior to that was um, PFA essentially. So it ups that number a little bit artificially in terms of um, looking at where our traditional PFAs are. Um, the last thing in the report on page 44, or one of the last things, is um, our agricultural land preservation activity for 2020. Um, there were 982 acres, including 11 farms, which were preserved. Um, since 1979, and this number, as you know, has gone up. This was as of 2020, um, a total of 74,211 acres of land out of the 100,000 acre goal. <laughs> um, almost $7 million have been dollars have been committed to agricultural preservation, and 60% of that was county funds. And this is the map that shows what you really already know that it's mostly in the rural legacy and priority preservation areas in the north of the county. But the one in the southeast corner is just awesome. <laughs> I mean, that is, that makes all the difference. So I don't know saying. why you would say that. Just saying. How many acres are still available to uh, pre possible preservation acreages? We don't have that number. We would have to work with AgPres to see um, what that number is. I mean, we know the number of lots, no commercial acreage. Could you find out rough, sure, roughly what is potentially available for that last uh, 23,000 acres? Mm -hmm. And how it ties in with the others, I mean, the numbers you have. Well, there's not a whole lot in District 5. <laughs> well, uh, District 5 looks like a possible. <laughs> Yeah, but you bring up an interesting point because what this does show is that we have a great balance because you look at the buildable lots that are up in the in the area where there's a ton of, of, of uh, ag press yep. and we, we're, we're doing really well with the balance that we have. So to the naysayers that say, well, you know, you're doing too much ag press. No, no we're not. Actually, you get a balance. Yeah, we've got a great balance going here. Yep. So this, this report 
reflects that. So I'm going to say we have a better than great balance. Um, yeah. This was uh, not required to be reported, but this question came up during planning commission. So this was just an additional slide we wanted to present to you all about preservation and development acres, and it compares how we are well outpacing development with our agricultural preservation program. We only have the last five years tracked. We could go back since yeah. the dawn of preservation and see, and I'm sure probably in the 80s and 90s it was flip-flopped when we had a lot of heavy development. But definitely, as you can see on this chart here, the blue represents residential subdivision acreage, the orange is commercial industrial site plan acreage, and then the gray is the agricultural easement acquisition. These are annual numbers, so this is not the cumulative, so you have to add it all up together. But as you can see, in many years, we are you know five-fold, six-fold in preserving land as opposed to the development. So in 2016, we only had 135 acres of residential subdivision. Um, and 188 acres of commercial industrial, but 2,100 acres of agricultural preservation that calendar year. And that trend continues with at least 1,000 or more acres preserved annually with only, a, um, you know, two to 300, or I'm sorry, three to 400 acres of development annually. But, but the challenge is that, you know, the hour years, we're going to see that ag go down because there's just not ag out there. To preserve and that's you know we're going after our goals but we have a finite number of agricultural you know zoned property so that 982 I mean <clears throat> there's a trend going down it's going to continue to go down the question is how dramatic the trend is going to go down before you know to allow us to meet our goals it might or it might stay steady um, goes yeah. to your question Dick yeah, I, I was just curious, you know, we have 45,000 acres roughly available out there yet. Right. And yeah, I don't, I don't know. So that. roughly 45,000 yeah. acres not designated. And, you know, it's going to get tight to make this happen if we're ever going to meet that goal. But if you look at, you know, what Carroll County is about, is that balance, as you said. Mm -hmm. People don't want to live house on top of house. As, I mean, anytime you put a development in, you know, the questions, <laughs> we don't want a development there. We like the open land and those type things. That's why people are here. That's why Carroll County is so unique. And it's our, I think, responsibility to keep that balance here so people do have those mm -hmm. open living areas or those yeah. view of uh, open areas. And it helps a lot of mental health that's going on in the county. So. If you can get those numbers, I greatly appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. and what I would say is, you know, we have one unit per 20 acre zoning in our agricultural lands. Um, and on top of that, anything that's not on infrastructure, water, uh, and mostly sewer, you can't build more than seven lots. So we really are confined to the municipal areas themselves for any type of major subdivision. Um, as well as um, in our freedom area that has the water and sewer infrastructure. Outside of that, it is that seven lot maximum subdivision. Director Eisenberg, you have one of the most controversial departments for a county, and sometimes I think you should have like a juris doctorate to do what you do <laughs> because there's so many regulations and mandates that you face. And I think you and your staff do a wonderful job. I really appreciate you doing charts and graphs because it conveys to the public the public awareness of what we're doing because you can actually see it. So thanks for all of your course. work on this. Of course. It's our pleasure. It's what we do. We enjoy it. <laughs> Any other uh, comments, discussion? It's for information only. We really appreciate it. Um, and I just remember that there were a lot of volunteers on the planning that worked yeah. through this too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Remember, remember Absolutely. to thank them because they were yeah. They were deeply engaged in this. Yeah. Well, all the approvals that you see for site plans and subdivision come directly from Planning Commission right. as well as the plans that those are implementing as right. well. Right. Yep. Uh, and uh, always looking for more volunteers that are, you yep. know, want to participate in this. Uh, uh, Linda, just one comment. Your Finksburg area uh, upgrade uh, grants and some of the things you have, you're getting some response from those here lately. So uh, uh, word's getting out. Uh, Good, yeah. So thank you. Absolutely. That's what we want to hear. Absolutely. So, so let's talk about the Freedom Sewer Survey, uh, about how many participants you went out to and results, and we'll go from there. 
Okay. We talked trash, now we're talking sewers. Yep. Yeah. It's a dirty dag. <laughs> yeah, basic things government needs to do. Community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so again, commissioners, I'm still here with you. Um, and Mary's going to just be my support here um, for this. And she also helped with this project as well. Um, so in May of 2021, in response to some community concerns within the Freedom Community, the department issued a survey for the Freedom um, Sewer area to 850 plus properties looking at their septic systems um, that were built before 1990. So the housing unit was built prior to 1990 on less than two acres. And we use that two acre minimum because at that point, um, it's harder to have replacement areas if you do have poor soils and maybe your entire lot doesn't perk. There's a lot of variables on how septic is placed, but looking at that criteria of that two acres or less, and currently, um, as I said, on on-site wastewater or septic systems, the purpose was to see um, any potential interest for that community to convert from you know, their on-site septic to the county's sewer system. So these were in the sewer envelope at one point in time, and we moved them to the long range area, the plus 30 years. These were existing homes that we did not have um, projects to move forward with extending the county sewer service to them um, in the form of the actual connectivity with the sewer lines and such. So we did this survey to garner response. Um, it's a very high level survey in terms of we asked very broad questions. Again, this was just to kind of touch base with the community, just to kind of take the temperature. If we choose to go further, more studies would have to be done to see prioritization of what would happen moving forward. So out of the 850 plus surveys that were sent out, we actually had 377 total responses in that 30 day time frame, which you know, as for any time the government sends out a survey, it's always hard to get people to respond back. Um, but I think the fact that we actually did mailings and then also gave them an online version um, really helps. So yeah, we mailed out 850 uh, to the targeted residents. So this map here shows the response distribution and they also make up the areas as well that we targeted. So where you see the purple stars, these were the general communities that were targeted that were formerly um, in the water sewer service envelope at some point in time and we moved the map because they had been developed for so long on well and septic out uh, beyond the uh, 30 year time frame. So it's pretty even the spread on who responded um, within the targeted area. And the next question we asked was, is this your primary residence? And the reason for this is we wanted to get a sense of who was renting and who was living there. When we did this through the health department last time, about seven or eight years ago for the Finksburg area, there was a lot of trepidation with a more official sewer survey because there were a lot of renters and renters didn't want um, didn't seem to want to have the health department or others coming in and surveying their property because they weren't the property owner and they were uncomfortable with that. So this was just giving us a sense of who actually um, li was living there, whether it's a renter um, or if it was owner occupied. And overwhelmingly in this area, it was owner occupied. And again, even though this is, seems like a redundant question, we just wanted to double make sure, okay, so maybe owner occupied, do you rent any of the property? And again, so you expect those numbers to uh, correlate as they do with each other. We also thought it was important to see how many people occupy a dwelling. Obviously, the more people you have on a septic system, especially on a smaller lot, um, the more use it's getting and its ability to have that longevity in the use of the system. There's a lot of other variables, just um, soils, how well someone maintains their system, if they get it pumped regularly. We didn't ask a lot of those detailed questions. We were just trying to really, again, touch base and kind of get a general sense of what this community is made of. So most of the units tend to be one and two dwelling um, occupied units, which comprise over 50% of the responses. And so this map just shows a brief distribution size um, and basically the smaller house, the lighter color are the one to two households. There are very few households that had more than four people. And again, it seems to be pretty evenly distributed. I wouldn't say one area sticks out over another of having more um, one and two dwelling units versus a three and four dwelling unit. 
The next question we wanted to ask is if people had re uh, replaced their septic systems. And this is important to note because if someone's just replaced it within the last few years, now we're asking them, let's just say we move forward to go on the county system, they may have a perfectly fine working septic system that they spent a lot of money on. It is not cheap to replace the system and that is not lost on any of us. Um, so again, just kind of seeing what that was. And I was actually kind of surprised given the age of a lot of the homes in the community that most, more than 50% have not replaced their system. Um, so I guess they're taking really good care of their systems. They have good soils. They're very, um, you, you know, they, they utilize their system in the most efficient way possible. And again, just a distribution of the replacement of the septic systems. And what I was looking for here in showing this map is were there any patterns that stuck out? Did one area seem to have a lot that had been replaced? Um, and again, I, I would say I don't think this really shows anything conclusive. I think um, across the board, you know, some have, some haven't. It's really just been a household by household as opposed to maybe a systemic community issue. And then looking at the length of time of when they replace their systems, so it seems that if someone has replaced it, it was at least 20 years or more ago these systems were replaced. Um, and maybe that was because they were already older homes. They didn't do a correlation of the ones who came up 20 years. Were they more toward the uh, early, earlier part of like maybe the 70s or 80s, um, they replaced them or uh, and when their house was built. And then also if anyone's ever had any septic problems, again, I mean, I know sometimes people are afraid to self-report on that sort of thing because they, you know, don't want to be then reported to the health department that they've had failing issues. So this was an overwhelmingly uh, no, but actually quite a few, over 30%, which I thought was interesting, did say yes, they have had uh, septic issues. Um, and either they've handled them in some way, shape or form, um, either replacement or maintenance or whatever. Um, so just I thought that was interesting. And again, the distribution, again, nothing really sticks out. Um, I would say probably toward the Gaither Road area, which is in the southwest corner where it's mostly green, um, had probably the fewest amount of septic problems. Um, more of the septic problems tend to be um, up by Freedom Elementary School, seem to be a slightly higher concentration. So that might be one area that, you know, for further consideration to see. And they are very close to um, sewer service being able to be distributed to that community. Um, and this was another interesting one as well that we were uh, frankly surprised that people would be interested in connecting. So out of the 377, 375 people did answer this question. They chose not to skip it. Um, and overwhelmingly, over 60% said they would be interested in exploring being on public sewer. And again, this was just a touch base, so I'm sure as more information ever becomes available or things move forward in any direction, um, we definitely would want to reaffirm this again. Um, and again, so if you looked at, uh, if sewer became available, where would you connect? I would say that that same community by Freedom Elementary School seems to be the one that would, had more of the issues um, and seemed to want to also be the ones to connect more. For the most common reasons why they did not want to connect, out of the 377, 117 had actual responses where they typed in. Um, and most is ones you would definitely expect that the cost to connect to county sewer in terms of our area connection charges, um, cost of quarterly bills, you know, when you're on your own private system, you don't have to pay that bill. If you want to have it maintained, that's on you to, to do that. The only thing you're required to do is pay that $30 a year bay restoration fund fee. Um, they have reliable septic systems already, um, and they've replaced their septic at some point in time and feel that, that they're good. So that's why they would not want to connect to the system. Um, so that's all I have for you, and that pretty much summarizes everything that we've done for this outreach effort. We wanted to make you aware of this and see if there's any further discussion you'd like to have today. So what's the purpose of this? The overall purpose the overall purpose is to see if the board of county commissioners would like to move forward um, with any other further investigation of this particular area um, again as i said this was brought up by the community to see if there's any need or necessity to move forward um, with putting those particular properties back on a 
in the priority sewer service area and extending service to them. Okay. If we wanted to extend the service to them, do we have sewer capacity to do that? Mm, well, we have a 20% reserved capacity um, as part of the water and sewer master plan and the Freedom Community Comprehensive Plan for areas that may have some issues. So there is some slight capacity to be able to do, to do that. I, we would not be able to serve every point on the map that I showed. Right, but the ones that wanted to, uh, you thought, you're saying you don't have enough to, to even serve the ones that wanted to switch over? So here's what I would say is we can't serve everyone that wants to switch over because it depends on how far apart they right, are. So, right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but if we did have an area that we, you know, this body determined or, and I would recommend that you would do further studies to, to confirm this very, I mean, this okay. is just a very first touch out um, to see really where the need is. So, so, you know, if I had to make a recommendation, I think the next step would be is looking at the areas of interest and seeing what the real need is to move forward, um, if any. And I can't say that by this, there's just not enough information. Right. And how it dovetails with the master plan and, you know, the the growth areas down in Eldersburg, down in the, the Freedom District. I mean, it's all got to kind of work together. You know, you can't, to me, look at one piece and not look at the others. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot that goes into this. I mean, the, the question is, do we, do we want to move forward with additional study and looking very specifically into this designated growth area for increased um, sewer capacity? Um, I mean, because, you know, Commissioner Frazier, you asked a, a very specific question and you did not get a very specific answer <laughs> But it's not because it's because it's a it, it's very complex, right. and you know it would take a lot of work. And it's not saying that you cannot well you cannot give a specific answer because there is no specific answer. The uh, the specific answer I think is we have to take a much harder and deeper look into this. Yep. Um, and then I apologize just to finish the thought is and then figure out how much resources we want to apply to this and. Um, it's going to be significant so in that area um if we say a housing development's been there forever and we decide to put sewer lines through there does everyone have to hook up to it that is yeah. currently how the mandatory. code is written yeah. if the line goes in front of their home they have to connect and typically and again these are all details that could be worked out at some future point in time but what would typically happen is we would put the infrastructure in they would pay an area connection charge and also be responsible for the run from their home to the, to the main line. Okay. So it would be almost two fees, so to speak, for them. Okay. Uh, are there areas that they really cannot, I know there are areas that they can't replace the septic system, right? They don't have a large enough lot or the park does not allow? I, I, I can't say. That, I mean, that would be an assumption on less than two acres, but I can't say for sure because with best available technology, mound systems, right. you can replace on smaller lots. There's just different different technology different technologies you would have to use with different variable costs. And then what are we incentivizing folks to do? I mean, it's expensive. You know, I mean, people are going to be satisfied with what they have right now, and then we start pushing yeah. sewer lines and saying, well, you're going to have to change. Now you got a big hole in the in your yard, and you got to spend yeah. money on. You know what I mean? It, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. Expensive. It's so, either personal property rights here. You do what you want. You, but what happens when you can't do that, or you put that mound system? Well, that mound could be replaced and redone. Mm -hmm. That system can be gone. But you know, they they don't get a perk. They can't redo that lot. It's a small lot in some of these areas. What do you do? Oh, absolutely. And then it's too late. Uh, so okay. it's a lot of questions off the yeah there oh is. absolutely there there is no doubt this is so you put this out to 850 right mm -hmm. you got 377 back correct so what what do you say about those other ones that didn't send back well do you say that, yeah. that because they didn't send it back that they're okay no I, th I think but I, I do think that we got a, a large response well, no, no, I'm not saying yeah. that, but there, there's, there's what, 400 or whatever yeah. that didn't, right. that didn't reply. Do you, do you assume that 
they didn't reply because they're fine? I would think that if you're not fine, you would have responded. And, right. But maybe yeah, that's, I did but not maybe that's wrong assumption too. Those who did not. Yeah, yeah I don't know. That is, a, that is correct. These, these numbers tell me right now that I don't really see the need to move forward. Right. Yeah. That's I, what these numbers are telling me, unless yeah. I'm reading it wrong. No, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, there's a small portion of folks that say, "Yeah, I got a problem," but most everybody said, "We're living with in a in a very respectful way." Uh, leave me alone. Yeah. No, absolutely. And Fifth I think, uh, kind of personality. <laughs> no, I, yeah. and, and I think those that uh, didn't respond, I mean, you can you can take a look at that. You know, we can do kind of the monkey mass saying these are the folks that think that if everything's fine, then these are the folks that just threw it away. You know, it came from the government, throw it away. Yeah, um, well, that could be true. So, yeah, there's, I don't know. But, but I think that there's, there's definite value to this, and I appreciate you going out and doing this. I think you got um, a very large amount uh, in response, this along with the um, your commitment and our commitment to working with the folks in the Freedom District uh, is important, and we're going to continue to move forward. Uh, what I what I'm concerned with is that we are going to be making decisions uh, for not <laughs> for uh, that going to be very expensive decisions, and that that's my biggest concern. You know. Um, that you know, we're gonna look at sewer lines, and we've talked about this um, in areas that they really don't want sewer lines. They're fine, like you said, they're fine. So it does, um, this is a great way to, to get that initial uh, idea of what yeah. is needed. And my thought is, at this point, it's not warranted. I don't see a distinct pattern, and we have not been alerted to anything by the health department at yeah. all. So right. there are no systemic concerns. Right. You're always gonna have individual systems in every place that will have a problem and maybe a particular house may have multiple problems and that's for various reasons that right. we can't pin down but if I looked at this map and said does one area stick out that has failing and has a need I would say no. Yeah. and there's there's a couple areas in my district where we could drastically need mm -hmm. we, we drastically need some sort of a system I will tell you, we've had worse places than this that we have that yeah. that have not. They, the, the actual community chose to yeah. not go right. on a yeah, wastewater in, treatment system. Yeah, in, insert. I don't know. I mean, just out of the off the top of my head, insert Middleburg Road area here that mm -hmm. that passes a ton of homes that are struggling up there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had a personal family member that that had to just put in a brand new system mm -hmm. in order to sell a house, and it was iffy at best getting that system in mm -hmm. because it's a mess up there mm -hmm. pun intended <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely so, so you know that looking at it that way on a more global Carroll County mm -hmm. overall look I would say you're good there but we're not good up here mm -hmm. which that's huge then. it's called because red then ground gonna, yeah then you got to put in you know talk, talking about infrastructure up there yeah yikes you know, you know how that red clay dirt is up there. Yeah, it's in Aruba. Er yeah. Everything, uh, everything you presented to us, uh, both the report and this, are available Online. to the community. Yeah. Uh, I asked um, push it to the community as well. Uh, those that may have interest, especially the larger groups. You know, the FDCA is one of them, uh, mm -hmm. and I know they have a meeting next week. They asked me to. Uh, to attend, I will not attend. I will not be available to attend. Um, but I, I let them know if they want to meet with me beforehand. They can, but uh, I will not attend. I expect either one of you or yes. possibly attending. So, if we can get this in front of them beforehand, as opposed to just presenting it, that may be a good idea and a good gesture. Absolutely. So I appreciate it. Um, okay. Anything else? If I may, you know, I'm no real estate agent, but I think. Looking at the numbers, there might be people out there looking at increasing the value of the property by having a sewer hook up to make it more marketable. When I look at the charts, I see a lot of the people in the one to two person residency are in favor of the hookup. So I'm trying to read into that whether those people are senior citizens that might want to unload their single family home and make it potentially more marketable. I'm just trying to figure out what those people are looking at on the wall. Yeah, that's a very, actually, that's a really great point I didn't even think of, so that, actually there's that potential. We, we see a lot of our, our 
their population is getting older and a lot of those people are probably don't want to downsize and let their single family homes go. And in the real estate market, I think it does increase their value to have the hookup. Not that I'm for it because I live on Woodbine Road and if this came up Woodbine Road and I was for it, I think I might have people out protesting from <laughs> my house and I'm sure Commissioner Wayne would have the same issue. I'm not saying one way or another I'm for it, but I do think there's a motive in there potentially as to why people would want this. Right. Okay. Thank you. For All right. Well, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you so much, ladies. Time. Take care. Yeah. Mr. Burke, why don't you come on down? Resolution declaring the county's official intent to reimburse expenditures with debt proceeds. Out of her Burks, are you the better of the two Burks? I'll leave wow. that to your discretion. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it over to legal counsel. That's actually a good answer. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Uh, this is an annual process as part of the follow up to your recent adoption of your. Uh, fiscal year 22 budget and the community investment plan that it contains contained within your uh, recent adopted budget is uh, funding that will be covered by debt proceeds we will issue bonds to accomplish a portion of your capital program the total amount of those bonds in the most recent uh, budget was forty eight million four hundred forty eight thousand nine hundred and ninety dollars what we're doing this morning is declaring the county's official intent uh, to be able to reimburse those uh, expended funds with bond proceeds. So essentially, it allows us to uh, work on the projects first, and once we know we've spent those dollars in the next upcoming bond issue, then we would reimburse those dollars back to the county in the form of bond uh, issue. So uh, I believe it creates a um, an efficient borrowing program. We don't borrow money that that we're not sure if or when we will spend it. There's some rules around that. I believe it um, delays the borrowing, which delays uh, borrowing costs and interest until we've actually expended the dollars. Uh, we are able to accomplish it within our um, cash flow and our cash holdings, and so it really isn't a problem uh, doing it in a reimbursement method when we do that annually. Uh, I did attach to the resolution, I'm not sure if you see it, uh, the general categories of the projects. We're primarily talking about uh, public schools at over 31 million, the largest uh, component. That's mostly the East Middle replacement and a portion of the Career and Technology Center uh, improvements, uh, as well as general public works projects, roads and bridges uh, at a little over 11 million, and some of the uh, conservation and open space programs uh, for the environmental and so forth is the majority of it. So, again, this is uh, no no obligation or risk to the county if we. Uh, change our minds don't do a project or if we uh, fund it some other way that's fine there's no commitment to borrow here uh, and we do the entire amount um, just to cover all potential dollars there's no requirement that we use exercise this authority but it provides the most flexibility to us to be able to uh, do it in this manner to spend first and reimburse so um, that should be a bumper sticker Right. Historically, we've done it this way. There, again, there's no commitment, no risk, uh, simply a compliance step that later I need to be able to provide to the IRS that we had taken this step before doing reimbursement. So you're, you're, you're sharing with us uh, the no downside. The upside is flexibility and efficiency. Um, right, flexibility and efficiency, yep, compliance okay. with the IRS when we go to issue. Okay. Um, yeah. All the above. Okay. Any uh, comments, discussion? I make the motion the Board of County Commissioners approve the resolution declaring the county's official intent to reimburse expenditures with debt proceeds. Second. Okay, I have a motion, I have a second. Any further discussion or questions for Mr. Burke? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, 5-0. Good, I'll leave that for your signature. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Go back to work. Mr. Burke, you have an extremely important responsibility right here. And a lot of public don't realize what you do. You're behind the scenes. When I think of the budget, they think of our budget director. I kind of think of you on at the tail end to wrap it up and keep us tight in the audit and compliance. So thank you. I'll put in a plug for my recent Carol 101 if you really want to see what we do. <laughs> there you go. Jump on there and check us out. That's a good idea. The more our public knows what you do, the better off it is. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Casway, Mr. Angle, come on up. Renewal of the Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority membership.
gentlemen. Uh, commissioners, uh, we're here today seeking your approval for, to renew our membership with the Northeast Waste Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority in the amount of $163,003.35, uh, which is for the FY, which is in our FY22 Enterprise approved budget. Uh, as a quick review, the authority continues to manage many procurements, waste recycling contracts, marketing of our materials, electronics recycling, cardboard recycling, and future land use and fee structure studies. Um, additionally, uh, they provide the county with thousands of hours of consultation services, uh, both from the professional and legal uh, aspects of, their op of the operation and uh, as it relates to solid waste. Uh, so we're here today for your approval of the authority budget. Has the numbers gone up? Uh, it's went up a few percent from last year's from inflation. And what's, raises, the, what's the few mean? Uh, um, I think it was... I think it was one, one point something like that. 150, yeah, it was like a 1.6 percent oh, okay. increase. Yeah. Yeah. Fuse typically three or more. I was like, wait a second. Okay, ah. so a 1.6 percent increase. I think I believe that's what it was. Okay. We're close to it. They're going to be critical with their future expansion of landfill and design and all that. They're an intricate mm -hmm. part of that force. They, yes. they could play a very large role, yes. That, uh, and and they're on call consultants. Um, Absolutely. Good. I think as you point out every year, the benefit we get from this far outweighs the money that we're paying for this. I mean, even dollar for dollar, we, we get more than, than what we pay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, anything further? I'll make the motion we approve Carroll County's <coughs> membership with the uh, Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority in the amount of $163,003.35. You've got to finish mean, Come on, I know. He didn't say it. I was going to kick That's the 35 I'll, cents. I'll, I'll make sure that gets solved for now. Okay, I got a motion. Is there a second, second. somewhere? Go I got a motion sure. second. Anything further to discuss? All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. 5 0. Oh. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. very much. Okay. Andy, come on down. Talk about a contract award for a Stone Manor pump station. And Marine. I apologize. Marine. Good morning, start us off. Good morning. Good morning. We are here to ask your approval to award a contract for engineering services for the relocation and stabilization of the stream channel adjacent to the Stone Manor pump station to Century Engineering in the amount of $67,735. Um, this proposed amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds should be needed. And I will turn it over to Andy to ask. Answer your questions. <laughs> Gentlemen, very briefly, uh, Stone Manor Pump Station is located in the northern portion of the Freedom District, immediately west of Maryland 32. Access to the pump station is gained via Johnsville Road and Strawbridge, Ter Strawbridge Terrace and, and ultimately from Judges Court. As, as Maureen said, the basis of this project is to, is to protect this pump station by relocating a 400-foot linear foot segment of, a, of an encroaching migrating stream channel back to the center of the stream valley and away from the pump station. The scope of work includes all, all of the engineering and permitting services. The construction plans will then be used as, as part of our FY23 capital uh, uh, um, program for construction aspects. The site will be stabilized in a manner as to prevent the stream from meandering back towards the pump station in, in the future. Presently, the, the fence line of the pump station is, is, is being uh, uh, somewhat eroded away, so it's, it's, it's critical that we uh, move, the pump, move the stream back away from the pump station to where it should be. Any questions? We built a pump station in a floodplain? It, it, it most definitely is within the floodplain. <laughs> How far has the stream moved? About 50 to 75 feet. And it's over many, probably 20 years or so. Right, you know, and, 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 right. Just and as with any stream channel, as the major storms come through, it moves quite a bit all at once. Right. I mean, overall, it's, I think, uh, a very good project that's happening. I really appreciate a lot of the work that's being done. I walk by it often throughout the week when mm -hmm. I'm walking the dog. Uh, the expenses are split between us and the state for the overall project. This is on us. Alone? This is completely on, on us. We, 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 we have full, we, we have ownership of the pump station. It's completely okay. ours. Okay. How large is the stream? 
I'm sorry, Commissioner. How large is the stream? Uh, it, it's an unnamed stream. It, it's yeah. not that large, but Sorry. but when it when it does rain heavily, it does carry a fair amount it's of water. It's a run. It's not a stream. It's, it's not a babbling yeah. brook. No. I uh, know. Hmm. Um, okay, I'll move Board of Commissioners award a contract for engineering services for the relocation and stabilization of the stream channel adjacent to Stone Manor Pump Station to Century Engineering, incorporate an amount of sixty-seven thousand seven hundred thirty-five dollars. Second, sir. I got a motion in a couple seconds. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing here none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. You do clean up after your dog, right? I do clean up. Oh, absolutely. Because I thought I didn't want that to be part of the stream. No, it's, it's in there. <laughs> we could name it no, Rusty it, it, River. It, it, it's it's in, in your office. Street. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. With that said, uh, installation of residential water meter vaults still within the Freedom District. I like a lot of the love going in Freedom District today. Go ahead, Maureen. Okay, again, we are asking your approval to award a contract for the installation of water meter vaults within the Freedom District service area to Mid-Atlantic Utilities Incorporated in the overall, overall amount of $236,345. This award um, will be made via a competitively bid term contract. These locations were bid as three separate groupings to generate interest and competitive pricing. Bids were solicited from four contractors and proposals were received from two of these contractors. As you can see um, the amounts below, uh, they are summarized and the bid amount is within the adopted budget. No additional funds will be needed and again, um, Andy can answer your questions. Gentlemen, very briefly, this project is part of the ongoing, uh, the, the, the overall system-wide upgrade from indoor meters to the current standard outdoor meters and vaults. It is similar to many projects that I, I have presented to the board for approval over the past several years. To, to date, 7,261 of the 8,230 Freedom District um, homes have been, have been fully upgraded to outdoor vaults and meters. With this project, the completed total will increase to 7,448 and we'll leave a balance of 782 units. And just keep in mind, of, of that number, 279 are the more challenging townhouse units, units that we have to, that, that, that'll take some time and effort to, to work through. The uh, Bureau has accelerated the, up, the upgrade process and plans to have the overall system completed over the next three fiscal years. This item includes three separate groupings. Group one includes Hawk Ridge Lane. Group two consists of 10 roadways, including Allen Court, Allen Road, Allen Drive and J Road, and Group 3 includes Holt Court, Margot Court, and Beckett Road. As, as Maureen said, Mid-Atlantic was a low bidder on two of the groupings and was a sole bidder on the third. And as I have explained with, with previous meter vault projects, this item continues to reflect the Bureau's proactive approach to grouping meter upgrades by street or area. This, ha this has resulted in substantial cost savings. The average unit cost for these three groupings is $1,260 as compared to our most recent project that averaged $1,535 per unit, or as compared to the now retired in, in individual unit approach that incurred an average cost of $2,500 per unit. Any questions for me? Yeah, the only question I had, and I think it was answered before, mm -hmm. Andy, was in, in some cases, when we put these new meters in, mm -hmm. we could see there's been an increase in the in the water bill because it's more it's more accurate. The so it could occur. I, you know, which one I'm talking. You and I talked yes. about one of those, and I truly think that that's why there was an increase. It wasn't, yes. wasn't due to a leak or or increased usage. It was because these meters now are incredibly accurate. The older meters that we use tend to tend to slow down as far as the the, the uh, counting mechanism. Uh, function works. These the, the, these new meters have no moving parts, and, and they're accurate to, to to within a tenth of a gallon. So they're they're extremely accurate. Right. And, and the battery lifespan is 20 to 25 years. Yeah. Okay. 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 It's it's interesting because the the groupings are not. I mean, it's very different neighborhoods mm -hmm. throughout Eldersburg and Sykesville. Yes. So. Okay. Any other? conversation discussion if not I'll move the Board of Commissioners award three contracts <clears throat> excuse me for the installation of water meter vaults 
within the Freedom District Service Area to Mid-Atlantic Utilities Incorporated in the overall amount of $236,345. I have a motion to second. Anything further to discuss on this one? No, seeing sir. here, see, okay. Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You, Maureen. Uh, Mr. Zaleski, the man, the legend. <laughs> okay, let's talk about transferring funds to the volunteer emergency services. Association. Okay, as part of the transition to a combined fire and EMS force, when you adopted your FY22 budget, it included money that in the past would have gone to Visa, but now was going to stay in an internal department to pay those bills. Uh, with the transition of director, uh, that no longer was going to be. Um, practical in the same way. So what we're doing is moving the money back to Visa as it would have been in other years and the individual companies will, will pay those bills as they have in the past. Hmm. So what I need is your approval for this budget transfer from the Department of Fire and EMS to Visa. Yeah. So there's no policy change, just moving money to allow us to execute it. Right. Everything will happen exactly as it would have, just the money will be sitting in a different place. Yep. Okay. I'll move the Board of Commissioners approve the resolution 022 to transfer $1,637,000 no, $1, and $1,639,640 from Fire Services Administration 0118 to Volunteer Emergency Service uh, association 0169 to restore funding previously removed to pay for utilities, uniforms, and special team expenses. Mm. Second. It sounds like you want to take a nap in between that motion. I don't know. I know. That's a long okay. motion. So I got a motion. I got to do it, though. Fine. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> got, a, got a motion. Got a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much. Okay. I'm glad everyone's in a good mood today. Life, life is good. It reminds me when it's not sometimes. <laughs> Speaking of where life is good, Mr. Singer, why don't you come on up? We're going to go into open admin. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on through Mr. Singer's eyes when it comes to COVID-19. Um, and then we will uh, finish our open admin with uh, closed minutes and wherever else we need to go. So. I know you guys didn't feel like you needed a full briefing today, but last he night. Has one. <laughs> Same one? Thank you, oh, that's not a little different. Uh, oh, okay. I just wanted to make sure in case you guys had any questions that you had the data that would go along with anything. It's a day about. That's right. Everything else is the same. <laughs> well, hopefully you've had some good vacation. So, hopefully you got a little bit of sun. You needed the vacation. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I've, I've had a bit of a break here and there, but uh, uh, I'm getting ready to take a, a long two weeks without a computer vacation in August. So uh, hopefully things will, will uh, ease up a bit so that uh, so we don't have any major uh, catastrophes while I'm gone. Um, and I do want to preface, thanks for coming in uh, relatively short notice to yep. uh, have this discussion. Um, I think it's valued. So yeah, forward. no, no problem at all. And I'm glad that you, you asked because it's good for the community to hear what's going on. And you know, I, th I feel like everybody thinks we're 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 kind of back to normal. And uh, cases had really uh, bottomed out, and uh, even nationwide. And, and the, the places where we're seeing the most problems is where where there are large numbers of unvaccinated people. Um, so things have been pretty good here in Carroll County for the most part. Um, there's a bit of an uptick this week, and uh, with the variants, it seems that things might be moving in that direction statewide, nationwide, and, and even here in Carroll County. I guess my biggest concerns are is we, we've had people who've been sitting on the fence about, you know, should I get vaccinated, should I not get vaccinated, and, and, and really just want to continue to encourage people who aren't vaccinated that are eligible to be vaccinated to get vaccinated because, uh, you know, 
it, this isn't over, and and uh, I, I'm concerned. I was concerned that in the in the fall we'd start to see an uptick. I'm a little surprised that we're a little bit of on, on an uptick now, and it, and it seems to be related to uh, to younger people who are who are getting the disease, where we don't have as many uh, people vaccinated. The uh, vaccination rates in our, our 12 to the 20 year olds is uh, about 49 percent and we're at about 50 percent for those that are 20 to, uh, to 29 and is nationwide that in, is that in Carroll County that's here in Carroll County um, nationwide we're, we're starting to see a lot younger people um, that are being impacted by some of these variants and that, I, I guess that's very concerning to me I know as we talked uh, last year with the school system and whatnot, the, the, the uh, virus wasn't having a severe impact on young people without underlying conditions. Now we're starting to see it have more of an impact on, on healthier people and uh, a lot of concern about those people who aren't able to be vaccinated. And we had the discussion at the school board last night that, about how, you know, this is probably going to cause us to have a lot of people in quarantine when, 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 we're, when, when they're back in school because um, it, the, the, the good news is, is the vaccine appears to work very well. Um, you know, the, the, there was a, uh, a press release by the governor's office talking about how none of the hospital, none of the, excuse me, none of the deaths in Maryland in June uh, were anybody that were completely va fully vaccinated. So the cases that we're seeing, uh, I, I think the, the rates are around 95 percent of the of the uh, illnesses that we're seeing that are hospitalized are, are people who are not fully vaccinated. And all of the deaths in Maryland are, were, were people who were not fully vaccinated last year. So I, I, I can't say it any better than that, that this vaccine works and that, that, that we need to encourage people to continue to get vaccinated. We're struggling to, uh, we've had mobile vaccination efforts out. Uh, we were at the uh, Pride Festival last weekend. We've, uh, we've been to a variety of, of other places. We went to the Food Truck Festival and we're getting a handful of people here and there. And those are people who probably would not otherwise get vaccinated, but we're not we're not seeing large numbers and we're continuing uh we've moved out of the sears location we're vaccinating at the health department now and uh, at least two days a week there are clinics available at the health department for people to come and get vaccinated vaccines readily available at the pharmacies and whatnot our our, our next big push is going to be when they open it up for the 12 and under and that's the population i'm really concerned about right that's now true. because uh we're seeing uh nationwide and actually here in carroll county we're seeing cases in, in, in camps where, where we're seeing clusters and, and uh, River Valley Ranch, and this is going to wind up in the paper today, is, is uh, they voluntarily decided to close down because of the number of people that they've had ex uh, exposed to um, cases of COVID. And, and uh, they're trying to hit the reset button so they can get going and finish out the camp year, gives them a chance to get through the quarantines and whatnot. But this is... Uh, you know, it's not a, over by any stretch of the imagination. We're really going to have a push when the uh, 12 and under population is uh, eligible for vaccination. We're going to um, we're going to do mass clinics still in partnership with the school system, but really would hope to try to get some of these uh, kids vaccinated in their primary care offices. And what we're doing for that is we're going to make vaccine available if uh, if they talk to us over at the health department. We can give you know if you got a pediatrician that has 10 patients they need to vaccinate, we can give them one vial as a opposed to right now if you order from the federal government you have to order somewhere between uh, 500 doses and 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 a uh, thousand doses to, to be shipped directly to a provider so we're act, acting as a as a hub a, a point of dispensing so that the practices can get the vaccine from us and, and really with the younger kids I think that's where the parents are most comfortable having their uh, their children vaccinated we really need to uh, to push with the younger kids to get them vaccinated so a lot of concerns about uh, large gatherings of people who are unvaccinated, and that seems to be where our hot spots are right now. And um, you know, continuing to push to, to try to get people to get vaccinated, and and uh, really concerned that these uh, new variants look like they're having more of an impact on on uh, younger people. Director Director Singer, are we having any juvenile fatalities? We, we have not had we, we've not had any juvenile deaths here in, in Carroll County nationwide there have been and, and there's there have been reports of you know I know some states have reported uh, as many as uh, as one hospital had 10, 10 uh, people under the age of 18 in, in the uh, in the ICU uh, last week and uh, so we, we've got to keep an eye on this um, I, I've anecdotally I, I don't have 
I don't have full data on those age ranges right now, but uh, I can gather that and get that to you. But the uh, anecdotally, I have seen that people that I know personally here in Carroll County that have had younger uh, family members that have wound up hospitalized related to COVID. And uh, it's, it's, that's concerning to me because we weren't seeing that before. And uh, while we haven't seen that, as you mentioned, we, we haven't seen any deaths here locally. We don't want to see any deaths of, I mean, you know, when we're talking about people who are in that age range, we don't expect them to die unexpectedly from mm -hmm. a disease like this. So we've got to do what we can to prevent it. And there's, you know, right now the people who are under 12, they're not eligible to be vaccinated. And I'm sure if the uh, if the eligibility was opened up today, there are a lot of parents who have been asking me, when's it going to be available? So I, I know there's going to be a push. You know, maybe it'll only be 50 percent, but that 50 percent is going to make a huge difference in, you know, the, the, the possibility of uh, transmission between students and school and things of that nature. And the other important thing to understand is, uh, you know, if a child is fully vaccinated, just like if an adult is fully vaccinated and say, you know, Commissioner Boucher has uh, has COVID and he's near some people and mm -hmm. the people who aren't vaccinated, they have to go into quarantine because we're concerned that they're gonna get sick and spread the virus. The people who are fully vaccinated, we know the vaccine is very effective and and uh, no vaccine's perfect, but we don't require those people to quarantine. So it's an opportunity not to have your life interrupted. And that's, that's the other thing I've been sharing with people, whether it's school age kids right now, only the 12 and up can get vaccinated, but if you're vaccinated and you're 13 years old and your classmate has COVID, you can stay in school. But the other person who's sitting on the other side of the kid, if they're not vaccinated, they, they've got to stay home for seven to 10 days. And that's really going to cause some problems for, for Dr. Lockhart and his, uh, his board of ed and, and how they're going to manage that without having uh, the virtual options as robust as they had uh, last year. So, you know, I, I can't do enough to encourage people to use, to use these vaccines. They've been in development. This type of vaccine has been in development for over 20 years. It's safe. You know, I, if, if people, people have some concerns about the J&J &J vaccine, and I don't want to taint certainly the other vaccines because there have been virtually no problems with, uh, with the Pfizer and, and the uh, Moderna vaccine that, that, to any great extent. Um, you know, there, there have been a few concerns, but, you know, any, any of the medical professionals that are out there will tell you that the, the risk for, I mean, the, uh, the benefit of the vaccine far outweighs any risk, even with the J&J &J vaccine. But certainly with the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, we've seen virtually no issues with those and, and really got to encourage people to get vaccinated. How, how, go ahead, please. Oh, I'm sorry. How is the mortality, juvenile mortality rate of COVID versus the standard influenza we have? Are they compatible? Are they up or down? Well, we're just we're just starting to see, uh, I think, cases of, of pediatric deaths. Back when before we had these variants that were were were, uh, were emerging, that were especially the Delta variants becoming a, a, an issue of concern. I, I really, you know, you know. The, the mortality rate amongst juveniles related to, to COVID was, was virtually none. Now, I think things are changing and we're gonna have to keep an eye on that as we're moving forward. So uh, we're gonna have to take, keep, keep a look at the, uh, at the data and uh, I'll try to, uh, to update you as, as this progresses. But this is just something within the last couple of weeks that's starting to come to light that we're seeing these cases in young people and we're seeing the hospitalizations and the concerns. Um, so we're going to have to watch where the data goes, and, and we'll share that with you as, uh, as uh, we get more information. Right. And I don't want us to lose sight of that. There is influenza out there, and if we yep. can see a comparison of that, you know, if we're justifying the vaccination of juveniles for the COVID, and then we see influenza actually has a higher uh, mortality rate, then we should look at that as well, potentially, for vaccinating juveniles. We, we do that on a regular basis. Right. We, we offer flu vaccine to, uh, to young people, and we work with the school system on that. Uh, that's been a big push for us every year. The, the, the flu mist was something we piloted here in, in, in Carroll County. We were one of the first counties to do it. We, we, you know, we don't want absenteeism from schools. And, and if we can, uh, we can prevent cases of flu and, and, and the, you know, regardless of the mortality rates, we, we want to keep the kids in school. And it's really important this year with, uh, with the struggles that everybody had last year not being in school that we do everything we can to help keep the kids in school. And we're dealing with uh, a lot of lag in, in people weren't going to their regular well appointments with their doctors and whatnot during the COVID pandemic. So we're dealing with a lot of lag in a lot of the pediatric vaccinations and we're working closely with the school system to make sure that we get kids up to date on those other routine vaccines that they may have, may have missed because we want them to be healthy and be able to be in school and stay in school.
Yeah, and I don't want to see COVID overshadow all the other responsibilities that you have that the public needs to be aware of as well. Okay. Now, a um, couple things. One, uh, more personal, the, uh, my parents were, uh, uh, a friend came over and then she got diagnosed with COVID because, and they're, they're all vaccinated. So like you said, the vaccine doesn't work 100%. Yep. Uh, they live in an apartment. They did uh, quarantine themselves for four or five days. They got the rapid test and they're both fine. But again, it's because they're vaccinated. Uh, gives them confidence. So I understand the push about the kids and stuff, but it's it's really for all of us, right? Yes. I mean, that's what we're, we're talking about is get vaccinated uh, to minimize the impact of what COVID can do. That's the, you know, kind of the, the final say about that. The uh, uh, one interesting thing is um, my sister is a pediatrician and they're testing now for both COVID and the flu at the same time. Right. Uh, there's a system that they use mm -hmm. to see whether it's COVID or flu. And she is pushing hard about the um, vaccination, um, you know, for, uh, for COVID um, because it's, you know, it's still out there and it's, it's really becoming very more and more difficult, so. And, and we're um, anticipating a, a, the availability of a vaccine that'll include both COVID and the flu yeah. shot in the fall. So. Yeah. Uh, That'd be good too. And I'll ask you a question, and I, I'm just curious, uh -huh. and, and you may not know the answer to it, but the, you're saying that the person that was with yeah. them in their apartment, were they fully vaccinated as well? They and were. Had, we had vaccine breakthrough, but I would assume, you know, even the people yeah. that we're seeing that are getting sick, yep. that they didn't wind up in the hospital and right. probably relatively mild symptoms. Right. And, and, and so, they, 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 um, the woman was fully vaccinated. Uh, she got tested, it was COVID, but she had very, very little symptoms. So. Um, yeah. So that's the other benefit. And this is the same thing we say about the flu vaccine all the time. People are yeah. like, well, I still got the flu. Yeah, but you had the flu and you had it for like a day and yeah. you weren't very sick. And it's, it's the same thing with COVID and any vaccine. You, you're having an immune response that your body's already uh, ha has an immune response for, for the disease. And, and uh, it, it certainly will lessen the impact of the disease, even if you get it and make right. it less likely you're going to transmit it to others. That's why, you know, I've heard Commissioner Boucher talk about herd immunity and some people have had it and that helps, but anybody who hasn't had it that we can get vaccinated, that helps us get to the point where we can live our normal lives and that's what we all want to do. And it's where we're going to struggle the most right now because we can't vaccinate the 12 and under until, until that's approved right. is that age group. And, and uh, so we're, uh, we still need to try to take some precautions to deal with that. The, um 4-H fair is coming up, uh, I mentioned early on, 31 July through 6 August. Yep. Large gatherings. Um, don't know if you're planning on being there, if there's a you know, discussion of having a kiosk there for vaccinations. I don't know if you want to talk hey, to the thanks for the there. opportunity uh, to, to advertise. You know. <laughs> we were talking about our mobile vaccination efforts and, and our, our, our biggest push is going to be, we're going to plan on being at the fair every day. Uh, we have our, our mobile vaccination vehicle. I can't get the thing. It was going to be wrapped with a big, nice health department banner and all that kind of stuff. I can't get it wrapped right now because I'm having electrical problems with it. I got to put it in the shop for that next week. But uh, the the vehicle will be there. There the, we 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 have uh, not only for the kids, but I figure as they're getting back to school and parents want to see their kids vaccinated before they get back to school, we'll have the Pfizer vaccine available so we can vaccinate kids who are 12 and up. Uh, they're going to have to be with a parent and mm -hmm. who's going to have to sign off on their consent. But we'll also vaccinate parents and anybody else who shows up, and we're going to make sure we've got the J&J &J vaccine, we have the Moderna vaccine and, and the Pfizer. So we have all, all of the, the three vaccines that are available be available on our, uh, on our vehicle, and we'll be there the entire week of the fair and try to make sure that we can uh, make it easy for people to get vaccinated if, uh, if they're ready. Okay. Try to throw that softball out there for you. Hit it Thank out of the park. You. <laughs> Any other uh, comments? I want the comment. You you have here on the GoVax promotion the most handsome commissioner is the model, Commissioner Frazier. Win -win. Really? <laughs> really? Well, you know, it's nice to have a good poster child. And we, we had a couple poster child last night on the Board of Ed. We had uh, the superintendent and, and Marsha Herbert who have gotten vaccinated. And we appreciate all of you as commissioners that have gotten vaccinated and participated in our campaign talking to people about why you did it. And, and it's just the right thing to do for the community. 
And, you know, there's been a lot of controversial things through this whole pandemic and, and, and a lot of things that you could argue one way or the other. I just think it's really hard to argue against getting vaccinated, and, and there's a lot of good reasons to do it, and there are almost no reasons not to. So anything I can do to encourage folks is, is uh, and, and the support that you all have provided in, in helping us get the word out there is, is greatly appreciated. What is that? Seriously? What, 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 what What's going on? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What, what, that, what are we trying forward. to do? Put the uh, picture of. Uh, no, I'm not sure. Yeah, what it was doing. a different yeah, picture. We really didn't want to see it. Was it was a serious, <laughs> serious glitch, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did see a very serious glitch. I think we may have been glitch. hacked. I'm not sure. <laughs> what else you got, Ed, for us? That's all. That's all, that's all I have at the moment. But I, really I did hear you talking it. about the septic systems this morning, and, and I, I was just trying to see when I needed to come over here. And I agree with you, Commissioner Wentz. There are a lot of problems in in, in areas. These, these old rural villages, we, we know that they're, they're problematic, but the, the cost to either government or to the people who live there is prohibitive in, in really trying to come up with a, a systemic uh, approach to that. We've, we've talked about this year after year, and it's just uh, it's, it's not something that anybody's been willing to bite off financially. Yeah. And, and uh, so that, that, that's, that's the hard part with those, those areas that you're talking about. I, I certainly understand that. So. Uh, Director Singer, I just want to state while we have you here, we've been on this, this journey together on COVID. And in the beginning, I said, you know, it would be contentious, but I think it would make us all closer. And I want to thank you for the exceptional job you've done. It's been a lot on your shoulders to take and handle, and you deserve the vacation you're going on. <laughs> and I'll just state that, you know, ever since I first met you, you've been very dear to me over the fact that I lost my daughter to the opioid epidemic, and you're very much in tune with that. I mentioned earlier this morning about the numbers up on the, the overdose deaths. So I'm behind you 100% on everything you're doing in our public for that, that issue. And we certainly need to refocus on that. And, and uh, we, 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 you know, it's been about three months now. We've really been trying to get back to the, uh, back to that and, and trying to get everything back in place that we had moving in a positive direction before COVID hit us. So well, you're you. a very honorable, distinguished man. And I appreciate doing business with you. <laughs> Thanks, Commissioner. Okay, you thank you. Thanks, Ed. Okay, what I'd like to, uh, is a review of the closed minutes uh, from October 8th. I need a review and approval of those closed minutes for Make a motion position. to approve the minutes of uh, July 8th closed meeting. Second. Okay, I got a motion and a second. Under the approval of the land acquisition closed minutes from October or July 8th. Anything else to be discussed? All in favor? Aye. 5-0. Oh. Okay, let's now talk to Ms. Vivian and Ms. Wanda. I think you're going to come on up and uh, talk about agendas. Um, first, uh, Vivian, can you uh, introduce no. who you have to your right? This is Wanda Hill. She's just joined our team. She is the new administrative coordinator for the commissioner's office. Awesome. Welcome, Wanda. Thank yes. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome aboard. Thank you. That means you have to put up with us. <laughs> <laughs> the air on the third floor is, is is so much different up here. <laughs> <laughs> because you're a filter? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to be said about this. Okay. <laughs> Let's... Uh, Let's start with next week, and it's going to be a relatively quiet week, I believe. July 19th, we have nothing. July 20th, uh, Commissioner Wance will be attending the Planning Commission in no. Room 003. No, he won't. He will not be attending. Uh, I will. I can't go to that one. So, I know you can't. I know you can't. I'll, I'll fill in for you. Um, really? Yeah, I'll do that for you. Okay. Case closed. It's Only because I like you. How's that? Yeah, well, okay. okay. I appreciate that. I mean, I think you're, it's you're necessary welcome. to have some representation. Lot, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, uh, I'll give you the, the stuff, and I appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. Okay. And uh, I will be attending uh, the Veterans Advisory Council. Um, I think it's still virtual. I think. No. I haven't it's seen anything first. come up yet. It's a, they might send it this week. Are they going to do it in person, you think? Yeah, they said they would do it in person this time. Okay, right. that'd be awesome. Uh, so, so where, I'll get though? The yeah. Okay, but I'll, I'll be attending that. I can verify it's at the Legion. Yeah. I don't know where. Okay, I heard a voice from above, below, sideways. Who was that? 
Yeah, this is Chris. I had I got verification from Jeannie yesterday that it is at the American Legion. Oh, at the American Legion. American. Okay. Post thirty one, right? I believe so. Okay. We'll double check. Okay, we'll double check. Okay. The man behind the curtain just spoke. <laughs> on uh <laughs> Voices on Wednesday board. we got nothing on Thursday. We have uh, Commissioner Weaver, Boucher, and Frazier attending Laura, Laura and Dave O'Callaghan Community Garden Celebration at the Finksburg Branch Community Library. At 4 p.m., Commissioner Frazier will be attending the Open House Ribbon Cutting Gauge Digital Media in Maryland IT Solutions in Westminster. Nothing on Friday or Saturday. Commissioner Boucher has the podcast on the 25th. Any changes? On Monday, so I apologize, as shared early on, Thursday, July 22nd, there will be no open session. Monday, July 26th, nothing, 27th, nothing at this point. On Wednesday, July 28th, Commissioner Frazier will be attending the Board of Elections board meeting, and Commissioner Wance <coughs> will be attending the Commission on Aging and Disabilities at 10 a.m. On Thursday, we will have open session. Uh, there'll be a briefing talking about the 75,000 uh, ag preservation and the event that'll be happening in the fall. There'll be a briefing discussion on the, from the Environmental Advisory Council. Question and approval of town county agreements of Hampstead We'll look at exercising an option on the Janice C. Judy property, Rural Legacy Program. And that's it for now, but I expect that will grow. Uh, at 5 p.m., currently we have Commissioner Wance and Frazier attending the Terry Tag and Title Services Grand Opening and Ribbon Cutting here in Westminster. Nothing on Friday and Saturday, and I look forward for August 1st where I will provide a podcast. Is there anything further for the good of the group? Okay, seen here and none. Uh, those, uh, again, just a reminder that uh, Brian DeLeonardo, the investiture is this afternoon. Congratulations one more time from the entire board to him uh, in taking over his role on the bench. I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. All in favor? Aye. Against? No. <laughs> 4-1.